The discussion for this video is educational planning as a concept. We want to look at what educational planning is as a concept. Meaning of educational planning. Educational planning is the roadmap. It focuses the attention of administration, board of education, teachers, students, community members, and help determine where the school district should be going and how to get there. It helps to identify pitfalls over the short term. And at the same time, when you're looking at educational planning, it involves the making of decisions for future action with the view to achieving predetermined objective through optimal use of scarce resources. The scope of educational planning covers curriculum planning, target staffing, manpower within the educational sector. The educational planning comprises one, predetermined determination of objective because we're talking about educational planning we need to look at the function of educational planning one of such function is that it has to predetermine the objective this involves setting target goals clearly in relation to national developmental goal another function of educational planning is that it utilizes the scarce resources to maximize the what it needs to be to be able to achieve the national goal. This takes into consideration the optimal allocation of the scarce resources in education, such as time in respect of to student time, teacher's time in relation to the level of knowledge to be required. Also, when you're looking into the education, the next function is that it helps in decision making. This refers to the actual preparation of the plan for each level at which decisions are taken. Now, what is the educational planning process? There is a process that you need to undertake where you are planning education. Now, in educational planning usually takes place at the national level. Also, it takes place at the state or local government level. When the planning at the national level or state level, the when you plan at the national level or state level, it will be referred to as micro planning. But when you plan at the local or institutional level, that will be referred to as the micro planning. Now, when you are doing a macro planning, in addition to the points, is sometimes called global view of educational development. It presents a national view of the fundamental aspect of educational development, such as educational financing, educational reform, and teacher training. Whereas in the area of micro planning, you look at the grassroots. This is not because this is so because it is concerned with an in-depth study of educational problems. The micro planning aspect focuses on the in-depth of the educational system and in this area you may carry out some kind of diagnosis made of taking into account both the general orientation of educational policy now let us look at some areas in micro planning that can be classified as school mapping educational disparity eternal efficiency when you are dealing with the micro planning the first thing is the school mapping that you need to consider in this area you are consigned with a problem linked with accessibility to the educational system. It seeks to satisfy effectiveness and maximize cost as much as possible while taking into account the overall objective. The next thing that you need to do at the micro level is the educational disparity. Now you try to look for a way in which to bridge the gap. Is this referred to a situation within the educational system whereby regional, state, or local government do not enjoy the same level of opportunity for educational system? So you try to look at how this disparity can be closed up. Then internal efficiency, the output is it does it quantify the input? And the output is being measured in the rate of student flow. You use it to student flow rate, whereby you have to consider the promotion rate, the dropout rate, and the repetition rate. How much was invested and how much, how many 
uh, students graduated at the end of it all. The main phases in planning process are one, policy making. You plan, you to make a policy, you plan to form, uh, to plan, you plan formulation and plan implementation and evaluation. So these are the areas that are quite germane when you are dealing with uh, educational planning. Now let us look at another aspect in educational planning. These educational planning methods. What are the methods that are used in planning education? We're going to look at them quickly. One, the social demand approach. The social demand approach gives opportunity that every give opportunity to every child that is of school age and that is willing to go to school to have access to education that is what the social demand approach is plan for every child every child that is ready willing and is of school age to go to school and based on this kind of plan we have it in the uba in the in the earlier part of, during the western region of Nigeria will have universal primary education UBE whereby the primary education was made free whereby all children that were of school age or primary education were allowed access into schooling and again this was repeated uh, in, the, in the 1982 because in, in the 50s we have the UBE in 1982 it was uh, graduated of whereby you have it up to GSS and today we have compulsory education from primary to GSS 3 so that compulsory education from primary 1 to GSS 3 can be classified as a social demand approach whereby you are given opportunity to all the citizens to have access to education now the next one is the more power forecasting approach if you remember the first is that you want to give access to all who are capable and willing to go to school. Now, the second one is the manpower forecasting approach. The manpower forecasting approach is, is uh, if you are using this method, it tries to bring out that it depends on the demand of the manpower that will determine the kind of schooling that will be made available, the kind of education that will be made available. And there are ways in which we this amount uh, power forecasting approach can be used. One of such way is the employer's opinion method. What happens is that you distribute questionnaire to the, the different setters, employers, and let them fill it to actually come up with the total number of um, map power required and the area where these map powers are needed. This will help to know the area where we need training, where education is required, where map power needs to be generated to fill the gap in the economic sector when this is done actually is focus is on improvement on the economic demand then the second one is the incremental labor out ratio method in this method labor is used to mean a particular type of manpower such as medical practitioner or teachers and output means industrial output or the national econ for this method to be applied one requires time series data on output per man cross classified by settle occupation and educational qualification now the next one is the density ratio method with the density ratio method which is sometimes referred to a ratio of saturation method is favorite of the russian planners it involved the following two involved two stages one stable fraction of qualified manpower in an economic sector are estimated secondly this fraction is applied to the population forecast of the total labor force as distributed among the various sectors of one economy i take it again when you are using the density ratio method things that we need to put in mind is that it involves two basic things one stable fraction of qualified manpower in an economic sector are estimated secondly this fraction is applied to the population forecast of the total labor force as distributed among the various uh, sector of one economy then the next one is the international comparison method 
This method is applicable to the economies of the developing country that lack adequate manpower data. It could be applied on its own, but it is more often applied in conjunction with another method. Then we talk about the rate of return approach. In this approach, here education is seen as an investment of good. Under the social demand approach, education is seen as a service, but here it is, it is seen as a service, but here it is not seen as a service. It's being taken as a good, and you are expecting a return from what has been invested. The rate of return approach is taken to mean the provision of skills and knowledge to the citizens so that the national output of the society may be increased. This educational investment has to be weighed against or compared with other investments in the nation, such as roads, communication, health, and agri, and so on. So when you are dealing with this kind of investment, you discover that you don't take it singly, you compare it with the other sector because you are look, looking at the rate of return approach. You look at this, for example, you look at the education, then you look at the health sector. Okay, which one is going to bring in more income? Which one is going to bring in more yield? That is at the mind. Then if you now come within the educational sector, you are having different programs. You have different uh, programs coming up. Let us assume you want to set up a program in the university and at the university, you want to uh, do maybe BA, uh, BA uh, English and another program you want to do MSc Economics. So you can weigh them which one is going to be more viable, which one will have a more return to the economy. So that will determine what program you need to run. Now let us see the educational system analysis. In every educational system, you need to analyze what is in there. And remember, in setting up an education, there is a goal, there is a purpose, that that educational system need to and it gave for the student system to drive there are inputs that are required and it's a process and there is an expected output so how do this go there is these resources flow year from year student trends in the educational system and you need to harness all this together and see the possibility of how each of them are uh, worked through at each uh, section so in educational system analysis you need to look in, in depth of every part that is required, starting from the input, the process, and the output to know whether they are able to really meet the expected goal or outcome. Now, let's look at the steps that are required in educational planning. There are steps that you need to take when you are planning. The first step is opportunity analysis. In Opportunity analysis, you look around your environment to look out for the needs, to look out for the situation that is in there. And in this case, we're looking for opportunity to start education. The best you could use is to use the SWOT analysis. The SWOT analysis here would give you the strength, the weakness, the opportunity and threats. The strength, that means what you have that you can help you to kickstart. The weakness of that you have recognized within the educational uh, sector you want to set up. Now, when you look at the opportunity outside the educational sector, what are those possible opportunities that you have outside the education that will be useful to the education? And what are the threats that might come in? These are not within education, but outside education. For example, police, uh, politics. Politics is a threat in education because depending on the kind of politics that is played that will determine what happened in the educational system. So again, the second thing you need to look at is establishment of objectives because this will serve as a drive on whatever thing you need to do. There must be a goal, there must be an objective because the objective is the guideline that will take you through every part that you need to plan up to implementation and evaluation. So when the objective is not right, then there will be a problem. Then you have to look at the premises, considering planning premises. And the plan, a planning premises refer to the assumption about the environment in which the plan is to be carried out. Each planning should agree to the premise. The critical planning premises include forecast, 
application basic policy and existing company plan so right here we also have to identify strategic alternative there will be different alternative you may want to use to achieve the objective the various alternatives have to be put on the table you have to weigh the pros and cons of each of the alternatives that are available and at this time what are you doing you are evaluating such alternatives because you have listed all the alternatives you have then the next thing is for you is to evaluate each of them and see how it will uh, infer on the objectives that has been set now selection of the best alternative after you have evaluated it pick the best alternative the best alternative will be the one that will help you to achieve the objective that has been set now preparation of support plan and budget here again you have to make regarding the selection of the course of action then the support plan have to be developed to support the basic plan in this area you have to give meaning to the plan budget are prepared to implement the plan you give meaning to it prepare your budget to implement it and finally is the implementation stage well if what you have planned is not in order there will be problems during the implementation because during your planning especially at the preparation of support plan and budget during that support plan where you are forecasting you would have known what is in the future and you'll be able to forecast if you didn't forecast where well, at the point of implementation you may run into some problem but however ensure that implementation is done as planned and where there is need to have a bit of flexibility it is allowed but ensure that it follows the rule